You know, there's a, a beautiful scripture which really speaks to me, and it's in the Torah portion of this week, um, which is towards the end of Deuteronomy, and I'd like to read it. I don't have it on the screen, um, but I know I could find it. Because me and, you know, Bible apps are like that. <laughs> so, uh, in Deuteronomy 26, it speaks about giving the first fruits offering. And we, when it comes to giving an offering and even giving an offering of our tithe, the first fruits is such a blessing to know that the, the, the first, God deserves the first of all we have. And there's something very special and holy about that first cut of what we have to give to the Lord. I spoke about tithing a few weeks ago and how it's actually the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. That 10% belongs to the Lord. But this is a different offering. It's the first fruits offering that's given. And it's not just given. The offering isn't just handed to the priest. It's not put in an offering box. It's not put in a collection plate. They didn't use PayPal or Venmo or anything like that. It was actually came with intention and it came with a declaration. And the declaration that they give is meaningful to me. And I pray that it's meaningful to you as I share this. So this is what it says. So this is Deuteronomy Towards the end, Deuteronomy 26, starting in verse 5. And this is when they, when they give the basket of their first fruits to the priest. It says, you shall make a response before the Lord. And here's what they had to say. They had to say these words. They had to say it. So they said this. A wandering Aramean was my father. So they went back into their history. He went down to Egypt, sojourned there, few in number. Started off pretty rough, few in number. And there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. So then we see his ancestors being blessed. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us. That's not good. And laid on us hard labor. But then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers. And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It's one of the 10,000 reasons in the Bible that we need to continue to pray for Israel because God gave them the land. And behold, now I bring the first fruits of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. So in other words, if I could just paraphrase it in a way that's more personal, they didn't just give their offering. It wasn't just something perfunctory. It wasn't just something that they did, you know, because they had to do. It wasn't just part of the church service or something like that. They gave their first fruits offering with an understanding of what God did, not just for them, but for their ancestors. It's almost like if I went and I gave my offering, and before I offering, I said this. My grandfather came to America and 1904, escaping anti-Semitism in Europe. And he came to Ellis Island, and he didn't really even know his name. He didn't know his, anything about his history. Uh, his mother was left behind in Europe. His father came with him. So he didn't really remember his mother all his life. But he eventually was given like an American name. And he, as he grew older, he wound up getting a job in New York. He was a taxi driver. And my other grandfather in New York, he also was uh, working in New York City as a young man, and he was very, very poor, grew up in much poverty. And to make a couple of, a couple of shekels, a couple of pennies, in New York City, he would push a, a fruit cart. And I remember that my father would tell me the, what's that? Yes, that my, my father would tell me the, the song he would sing in his Jewish accent, his Yiddish accent, as he pushed the cart in Manhattan. He used to push the cart and he would go, cherries, strawberries, and then bananas got a little flourish. Bananas. And that, that was his little song. And I was, I was told that by my father. But they, he grew up, my father and my mother, they grew up with a work ethic, a good work ethic, and they were the first people in their, in their line to go to college, to have an education. They went at night and they, and they worked hard during the day so I can get an education as well, so I can get a good education. But then as, as teens in my 20s and started to kick in, depression really kicked in hard for me. And anxiety kicked in hard for me. 
and just not being happy in life kicked in hard for me in my late 20s and in my 30s. And really my identity when I was that age was really more about anxiety and just being an anxious person and always feeling this from 24 by 7. But the Lord came and delivered me. The Lord introduced himself to me and set me free. And because of that, I give my offering. That's the spirit in which the offering is given. A look back, not just in your own past, but even where you came from. And recognizing that God did an amazing work in your family, in your life. And for that purpose, I give my offering. And it's such a beautiful sentiment. You know, we're so quick to want to forget the bad stuff that happened in our life. Like, okay, that was bad. I'm going to leave it behind. There's even scriptures about that. Paul said, leaving what is behind, not looking back. Forgetting what is behind, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press forward towards the high calling in Messiah Yeshua. You know, and even in, in baptism, or in Hebrew, the mikvah, and in baptism, we leave behind our old life. It's bo- the born-again experiences. We leave behind, you know, born Lisa or born Lori, and we come out a new creation. And, and the old, the flesh, gets left and it doesn't come back up. But i got to tell you something. There's something about our history that isn't left behind. It's built upon by the Lord. And it's something that God can use. And even the, the, the parts of our personality and the parts of our, our, our lives where we think it was actually just nothing but rubble and nothing but destruction, God finds gold in these things that he can use for his glory and for his kingdom. Not everything in your past gets left behind when we accept the Lord. God says, okay, a lot of it was bad, but that I'm going to use. People come out of addiction, and now all of a sudden they're able to minister to people that have addictions. People that come out of depression can minister to people that have a spirit of sadness among them, uh, within them. People that come out of bad family situations, can, it can be used by God. We want to forget it, but God can use it. We want to forget it, but God can use it. And this is such a beautiful reality in the kingdom. You know, there's a scripture in the book of Judges that spoke to me about this in my quiet time this week. And it was about the story of Gideon. Now, Judges is a really weird book. Judges is a, is a time period in the land of Israel where it was after Moses and Joshua were gone. It was before King David came around. So they're in this interim place. And yeah, they were given the laws of Moses, but they were still really fresh out of not knowing anything, their left hand from the right hand. And they lived their life really not understanding the ways of God and really not understanding how to live, uh, live a life according to God's word and according to God's ways. And without a leader, they just kind of went sideways. And the whole book of Judges is about that. They went sideways. And if you read the book of Judges, you're going to read some things that are like, that's really ungodly. That's, why did they light the tail of that fox? That's animal abuse. You know, we're supposed to read these things and not read them as actually good things. We're supposed to read them as actually bad things. We're supposed to read it through the thread that we see throughout the book of Judges that there was no king among them. They didn't have a king. So they were doing everything that was right in their own eyes. They were just doing what they thought was right, which was wrong. So they went through these seasons, the Israelites, they went through these seasons of just living terribly, and then God would allow the enemy to to, to oppress them and bring them to a place of humility and bring them to a place of crying out to the Lord, and then the Lord would hear them, and the Lord would bring a deliverer or a judge, a leader for them, who would um, militarily deliver them from their enemy, teach them the ways of God, and they would go through a season of living righteously, until the judge died, and then they went back to their old ways. Just, uh, you got to, you know, wonder why Moses called them stubborn, stiff necked, our ancestors. So, this was sort of the, 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 the flow, the ebb and the flow of the book of Judges. And then all of a sudden, you know, in one of the times that uh, they were being oppressed by the Midianites, by the uh, land of Midian, uh, God raised up a man named Gideon. And not just because Gideon rhymes with Midian, well, that, that sure makes it easy to preach. So Gideon is raised up to deliver them from Midian. Are you Gideon? Is that what you said? <laughs> that was good. No, I ain't Gideon. <laughs> you guys are crazy. So, stop making me laugh when I'm trying to preach. 
So Gideon, no kidding, Gideon. I don't know if anybody watches The Honeymooners, you know, with Ralph Cramden and, you know, and Ed Norton. There's this one episode where, uh, where they were in a play together, and Ralph was uh, playing this, uh, um, uh, this rich, rich guy, and he had this voice like this when he was, when he was rehearsing, Rachel! And Norton played this uh, one other guy, and Norton was reading the script, and he went, I don't own a mansion, or a yacht, or a string of palopanies. And then Ralph was like, Palopanese? What's Palopanese? And he read, he's like, that's polo ponies. But then he couldn't get it out of his mind. Even on the stage, he went string of Palopanese. So he couldn't get it out of his mind. So now I'm not going to forget Gideon, no kid, no, no, no Gideon. Anyway, so Gideon delivers them. So before he delivered them from Midian, I'm going to have to move to another part of this sermon. I just can't get it out of my mind right now. So, so before Gideon delivered them from Midian, he asked God to prove himself, show, like, this is this real? Is it really you, God? And he showed him through a sacrifice. But one of the first acts, the first act of, um, of, of, of righteousness or of, of strength, I guess you could say, that Gideon did was he destroyed the idolatry of his dad. So his father had all of this idolatry in his house, uh, I- idols and altars to Baal, Baal uh, the false god. And Gideon was told to destroy them all. But he wasn't just told to destroy them all. There's something that I find very, very meaningful. It spoke to me in my spirit as I read this, is that he was not only told to destroy those, that idolatry, but he was told to build an altar to the Lord on top of it. On top of it. And I believe that that's what God does for us in a lot of ways. There's so much of what we, of our struggles in our past that we really leave behind. And, it, and it's, it's a desolate place and we don't really want to look back there. But God sometimes says, you know what, I'm going to build an altar on top of it. Not that it's idolatrous, but I'm going to build upon that. And I'm going to build something for me upon the troubled past that you have. You know, I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago here about our trip to Israel and how we went to places that were called tells. And tells are um, civilizations that were destroyed or forgotten and then just kind of left where nature kind of overtook it. But then another group came in and settled over it. You know? And when you dig in Israel, when there's archaeological excavations, they, they discover these tells, civilizations on top of civilizations. You know, Like you have first temple period, Jewish first temple period, Jewish second temple period, then Roman, and then maybe um, Christian Crusader, or um, Byzantine, or Ottoman Empire, or some of the Muslim empires. And you, know, you see all these different civilizations, one, to, one on top of the other. And they're called Tells, right? Like we, we know, like Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, right? Tel, now, Tel Aviv is not a Tel. It's not a civilization on top of a civilization, but it was named after a Tel. Tel is something that refers to the old, and Aviv is the Hebrew word for spring. So the way, the way they named that town was like old and new. Old and new, so Tel Aviv. But Tel is the same thing. But a Tel is a civilization on top of a civilization. And it, it's often thought of it as bad, but in, other way, in another way of looking at it, it's that God can take the ruins and he can build something good on top of it. And I believe that's what he does in our lives. That he builds on top of even the things that we've came out of, the difficult times in our lives, he can find the gold out of those desolate places. And he could use it for his glory if you let him. In the story of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, you know, slavery ain't good. What can God build on from slavery? Slavery is a very bad thing. And the children of Israel, our ancestors, were in slavery for 400 years, and they came out from, by the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, an incredible symbol of Jesus, the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. And they came out with, with salvation, with victory, with deliverance. And they came out, but they didn't come out empty-handed. They didn't come out empty-handed. The Egyptians, as they were leaving, they were, they, were just, they were so done with the Israelites being there and all these plagues happening. They said, not only leave our land, take all our wealth. Here's some jewelry, here's some earrings, here's some necklaces, here's some bracelets. Just take it and get out. So the children of Israel, they left Egypt not empty-handed. They left Egypt with wealth. With wealth. What do we learn from that? That God can bring us through very, very challenging times, very, very difficult times, 
But when the season is done and we are delivered from it, let me tell you something. You ain't coming out empty-handed. You ain't coming out empty-handed. You're coming out with gold. You're coming out with gold. You may want to forget it. You may not want to look back. You may not want to pull a Lot's wife and look back, whatever it is. But God found something in you that is usable for the kingdom. If you let him, the gold that they came out with first was used for the golden calf. That's not good. But after that, God enabled them to use the gold that came out of Egypt for the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness. In other words, the articles that came out of slavery, slavery, all the things that they came out of Egypt in a place that was a place of of dread, a place of, of persecution, a place of slavery, what they came out with was used for the building of God's house. Do you hear that? What they came out of slavery with was used for the building of the house of the Lord. And that is meaningful to all of us. When we come out of times of trial, it ain't all left behind. You're coming out with gold that God can use for his glory, for his kingdom. An amazing picture of this is what the women brought and how the women contributed to the building project of the tabernacle. The women gave their mirrors, gave their mirrors. The mirrors were used for vanity, to take a look at themselves, to put the makeup on themselves, to do things to to make sure that they looked beautiful in the natural. And they gave them up, and it it explicitly says that the mirrors used by the women were used to create the wash basin so the priest can wash himself and be ritually pure before going in. So what they used for vain reasons wound up being used for holy reasons. What was used for vain reasons was wound up being used for holy reasons, kingdom reasons, to build God's house. And I want you to know that because we all go through very, very difficult seasons. But you ain't coming out empty-handed. And recognize that. And even the things that we're going through now, even if we're going through those seasons, because life has its seasons. We're seeing the leaves right outside this door, a little orange, a little red, a little yellow. We're seeing the changing of the seasons. So even the seasons that you're going through, if you're going through a hard one, just know that it is a season. That it's not permanent. It's a season. And at the end of the season, in kingdom economy, you ain't coming out empty-handed. You're coming out with something that God needs. And if he didn't, if that wasn't the case, he wouldn't have you go through it. Even if it's the, it's the, even if it's the, the fruit of repentance... I've shared this story before, and it's, when I share it, I almost feel like, eh, you know, it's, people go through such trials, such loss, such grief, such devastation, like it almost seems simple, what I went through, but I just want to share about it, it's when I was working, I I think I've shared it here before, I've worked at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, I've probably shared it before, Um, and this was before I worked at Citizens Bank, which was before I was retired. (laughs) So, I, but before Citizens, I worked at Pfizer. I was in their IT department. I know nothing about medicine, except for what Susie tells me. She's the nurse. And um, so I worked in the IT department at Pfizer. And it was, when I was growing up, when I first got jobs, when I was first employed, I was a computer programmer. And I was good. I was good. I knew how to make those computers shake, rattle, and roll. Rattle and hum. I would make him do backflips if my boss asked me to do it. I was good at it, and I liked it. I enjoyed it. I was trained in it. I was good at it. I excelled. I knew what I was doing. But then Pfizer made a business decision to no longer hire any computer programmers, and they were going to outsource all computer programmers. So goodbye, on-site, hired computer programmers, and hello, contractors in India who can do the same job for a whole lot less money. 
So what did they do with the computer programmers like me? They didn't fire us. They uh, transitioned us into project management. Now, I didn't know anything about project management. The only thing I knew about project management and project managers are these are the guys that waste all my time bringing me into meetings and giving status reports when I could be doing what I like in computer programming. And these, these, uh, these dumb project managers keep wasting my time with meetings that are not even needed. That was my, and, but now here I am as a project manager, so instead of actually coding computers, now I'm managing budgets, now I'm managing resources, people, now I'm managing time and scope and all of these things, and, when a, when, and whenever the project was kind of going sideways or going southbound, it was my fault! And I didn't have the ability to fix it. When I was a computer programmer, if there's a bug, I knew how to search for the bug and fix it. But now, I have to rely on the guy offshore. You know, this isn't working, what are you gonna do about it? And you know, if, and whenever there's a problem, it always, the, the finger pointing was at me. And I didn't know how to operate in that environment. I wasn't trained in that. I wasn't trained as a manager. I wasn't trained as a project manager to manage actually a work effort like that that involved many people and many things. I didn't know what I was doing. Put me in my cubicle and tell me what you want this computer to do. I'll have it do the can-can if you want. But just, I didn't know, I didn't know the skill, I didn't have the skill set for it. And it really read, and it, and it really showed in my reviews. Anybody get reviews? Anybody work for companies where you have to get reviews? Like you go through your mid-year review and your end-of-year review, and mine were, were really bad. Just bad, right? Raises were bad, if at all. Reviews were bad. And it's just because they didn't know what I was doing. And they, they I, I, I could, it wouldn't click. It wouldn't click. The whole thing just wouldn't click. This whole project management wouldn't click. It wouldn't click with me. And it was years of, of just hell in the job. It was really a horrible, horrible time for me, even in my personal life, because everything that I was overseeing was going southbound, and I was accountable for it, and I would have to stay up like all night because like the, you know, the, the team in India, they work when I was normally sleeping. Not anymore. I had to stay up with them. I was staying up for like seven, like you know, forty-eight hours at a time. It was like it was, I was, I was literally losing my mind. And as hard as I worked, I was still getting these terrible, terrible, terrible reviews. And I would tell my boss, like, I worked so hard. He's like, Yeah, but you're not working smart. You're not doing it right. I don't care if you work hard. You're not doing it right. It all culminated in me getting fired, laid off, fired, whatever it was. And one of the best moments of my life. I seem to have a, a history of like enjoying getting laid off, you know, I don't, I don't know what's happening. But um, anyway, so they let me go, and I went through a, like a summer, like May to September or something like that, where I was unemployed, and eventually got the job at Citizens Bank. Now, if, I don't know if anybody from Citizens Bank is watching this live stream right now, but if you are, you're going to hear something that you probably didn't know. When I set up my resume for the job at Citizens Bank, I lied my took us off. I wrote that I'm a great project manager. Because <laughs> I, I, Originally, I was thinking I was going to go back to computer programming. But guess what? In the time that I was a project manager, computer programming went, computer programming went a whole different direction. I didn't know what I was doing anymore. The, the technology from you know, 10 years ago is not the technology now. So all of the skills I had was not translatable. I couldn't get a job as a, as a, as a computer programmer. So I had to go for this project management again, and I just lied on my resume. I am not recommending that you lie on your resume. But I lied on my resume just to tell them, you know, embellished. I embellished my resume just to tell them how great the projects were, and I managed all these multi-million dollar projects and all these resources and offshore resources and all these things to make it sound really great. And I duped Citizens Bank into giving me the job, and they gave me the job, and now it's time for me to be a project manager. My last time doing it, I didn't do so well. But I, all of a sudden, now it's time for me to do it, and I'm given the assignment, and all I could tell you, all of a sudden, everything in a moment clicked. It clicked. And all of a sudden, I'm doing the things that I failed at at Pfizer. I am excelling where I am. I'm completely excelling. So much so that I'm getting accolades from like very, very high-level people. And I, I was amazed, amazed 
that I was able to do this thing. Why, all of a sudden, did these things that would confuse me, where I was not able to succeed, not able to function in my job, all, and I leave that job, all of a sudden, these exact same things, these exact same skills, I'm able to do easily, naturally, it, like, like an expert. Apparently, I came out of that Egypt experience with something. I came out with skills that I didn't know I had. All that stuff was training. I didn't know it, but it was training. And I wound up excelling. Now that doesn't sound very spiritual because it's all about work, but I tell you right now that when you're going through hard times and the season ends, you're coming out with something. And the time that you're in is not a waste, it is training. It's training. It's training for something that God needs. And what did he need? Citizens Bank job became so easy for me. It became so easy for me. It was one year after I got the job at Citizens Bank where Rabbi Peter, who used to oversee, be the rabbi here at Mishkan David, moved to Haiti to serve our orphanage in Haiti. And he ordained me, originally ordained me to be the rabbi here. I never, ever would have had the time or the energy to serve a congregation in this way if the job wasn't as easy for me to maintain. And that all came out of a hellish, absolutely hellish experience at Pfizer. So just bringing this all together, the times of struggle that we go through, I tell you it's for a purpose. I tell you it's for a reason. And it may look like devastation, but God wants to build an altar on that. There's an altar to be built on that, that God will use for his glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just want to end with just a little bit about covenants. Because covenants come, we're in a covenant with the Lord, and it's the new covenant, based on the blood of Yeshua. It's the new covenant where it's his body broken for us. And maybe we can start communion as I talk about this. It seems to be a good segue into it. The word for entering into a covenant in the Old Testament, it's not like coming into a covenant or entering into a covenant or, oh yeah, thank you, that'd be great. Or entering into a covenant or anything like that. The word for it is cutting, cutting a covenant. Karat, a covenant, cutting a covenant. Entering into a covenant involves a little bloodshed. It involves some pain. When we enter into covenant, there is pain. But God makes a way where it is for his glory. The original, the first time we see the word covenant in the Bible is with Noah. And it's the covenant that he made with Noah that he's going to survive the flood and then he's never, God is in the covenant he's never going to destroy the world with a flood ever again. So what is the blood? What is the blood that cut that covenant? What do we see? It's not the little sacrifice that, that Noah made after he was off the, off the ark. A little sacrifice of thanksgiving. The, the blood of the covenant must have been the blood of humanity that got killed because of its unrighteousness. That must have been the blood of the covenant. And then God said in his covenant, in his side of it, he said, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to do that again. The next time we see covenant is with Abraham, where he made the covenant with Abraham and he made all these promises to Abraham is that if you keep my ways, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. You're not even able to count your descendants. It's going to be like the stars in the heaven and the sand of the sea. So let's get into the covenant. Remember the first covenant Humanity died. Now it's time to make another covenant. And it was time for the, for the covenant to be made, which is the covenant when it's cut is between the two parties. One, par one party has its responsibility, the other has his responsibility. And in that story, animals were sacrificed. And one was put on one side, and half of the animals, the dead animals, were put on the other side. And the, 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 the um, what happened with the covenant was that it was saying that the covenant between the two people was that if, if one of the parties breaks the covenant, what happened to these animals will happen to you. Now it's time for Abraham to walk through, to get into, enter into that covenant with the Lord. 
and the Lord put Abraham to sleep. The Lord put Abraham to sleep. And it was the Lord in the vision of a torch that went through. In other words, the Lord is saying, this is the covenant between you and me. And if it's broken, what happens to these animals is going to happen to you. He put Abraham to sleep and the Lord went through it. Which means that when we break the covenant, the punishment goes on him. The first covenant is that humanity died with the cut of the covenant. And then the next covenant is an amazing prophecy of Yeshua who takes the punishment upon himself. Abraham was put to sleep and the Lord went through alone and said, saying that I will take the punishment upon myself. And that is a symbol of the new covenant. The new covenant. The new covenant cuts hurt. Mine was, I was eight days old. I don't remember it. But ask some adults who went through that. It hurts. Cuts hurt. But in the new covenant, the only cut we get is the circumcision of our heart. And that's the cut of the covenant. So it's hard, but the Lord takes our punishment upon himself. And I tell you right now that the challenges and the hard times we go through this is what it means to be in covenant with the Lord. The hard times that we go through, He will use for His glory in ways that you won't know. In the areas that you are praying against and saying, Lord, take me out of this, I'm done. In those areas, God sees gold. He sees gold. You see devastation? God sees gold. God says, you know what, if you look at this through my eyes, there's a little shiny thing there. I know you see a lot of rubble, but there's a little shiny thing right there. And once the season is over, I can use that because I'm building that. And you will see it if you submit to the process, if you submit to the covenant. Thank you, Father. Let's have communion together.